When 20-year-old Matthew Leveson failed to return home after a night out clubbing in Sydney, his loved ones were worried sick. Suspicion soon fell on Matt's partner, 45-year-old Michael Atkins, after it was revealed that the pair were fighting on the night of Matt's disappearance. But was that unfortunate timing, or did Atkins have something to hide? Maddie is the latest podcast from Casefile Presents, a 10-part series narrated by Lauren O'Keefe from the Missing Persons Advocacy Network. Maddie from Casefile Presents is available to stream for free right now, only on Spotify. Stay tuned until the end of today's episode to hear the trailer. Our episodes deal with serious and often distressing incidents. If you feel at any time you need support, please contact your local crisis centre. For suggested phone numbers for confidential support, please see the show notes for this episode on your app or on our website. It was the evening of Tuesday, January 24, 2006, and Mexico City's Arena Coliseo was alive with the thunderous cheers of a 5,000-strong crowd. The venue was hosting Lucha Libre, a traditional form of professional freestyle wrestling celebrated for its high energy and dramatics. The headline match was an Incredibles event, with the good guy Technicos and Dirty Dealing Rudos mixed together on two teams of three. Each wrestler, referred to as a luchador, proudly displayed his individual persona in the colour and pattern combinations of his lycra costume and mask. Whether Technico or Rudo, spectators encouraged their favourites and taunted their rivals. The luchadores put on a show, thrilling the crowd with shooting star dives over the ropes, flying kicks to the chest and body slams from atop posts. Then, in a carefully disguised illegal manoeuvre, veteran Rudo wrestler Universo 2000 conducted a low blow kick to the groin of rising star Technico Dos Caras Jr. With lightning quick reflexes, Dos Caras Jr. caught the kick. In a follow-up move that broke one of the most sacred rules of Lucha Libre, Universo tore away Dos Caras Jr.'s mask revealing his face. The crowd booed and jeered. Universo and his team were immediately disqualified. The match was over. Just before 2.30pm the following day, and only a few kilometres from the now dormant Arana Coliseo, Joel Lopez made his way along Jose Hota Hasso Street, The 25-year-old student had just finished his shift waiting tables and was heading to the house he shared with his landlady, 82-year-old Ana Maria Reyes. The pair lived independently in separate areas of the building accessed via a communal entryway. Upon entering his home that Wednesday afternoon, Howell noticed the door to Ana Maria's portion of the house was open and decided to pop in for a quick hello. But before Howell could enter, a tall, broad, muscular figure suddenly burst out of Anna Maria's room. Wearing black pants and a red sweater, the person knocked Howell aside, then barged down the hallway and out the front door. After pulling himself together, Howell called out to his landlady. There was no response. He walked cautiously into Anna Maria's living room, then stopped in his tracks. Anna Maria was lying on her back on the tiled floor. Her legs were crossed at the ankles and both her hands were curled into fists. Blood covered her badly beaten face and a stethoscope was tightly wrapped around her throat.
At first, the numbers were small enough for the authorities to ignore. It started in May 1998 with Maria Salceda. Maria had been found in her home in the Modelo district of Mexico City, strangled to death with a cord. By the end of that year, two more women had been murdered. A further six were killed over the next four years. As there had been more than 3,300 homicides in Mexico City during that time frame alone, these nine murders failed to raise any alarms. That all changed by the end of 2003. That year, 12 more elderly women were killed. Nearly all had been strangled in their homes with objects such as cables, scarves, telephone cords, and on numerous occasions, a stethoscope. Police had finally noticed the pattern and on November 5, 2003, they indicated that a serial killer might be on the loose. The media dubbed this person El Mataviahitas, the little old lady killer. 2004 marked an escalation in the killer's violence. Of the 16 women murdered that year, 12 had also been beaten. One had even been body slammed. All of the victims were middle or lower class women who lived alone and habitually frequented their local park or public garden. It was also discovered that since 2001, they had all registered with the state government's social welfare program for senior citizens, known as Civale. Created by the left-leaning governor of Mexico City, Andres Manuel López Obrador, this program afforded free healthcare and public transport to those aged over 70, as well as a stipend which was the equivalent of about 70 US dollars a month. It was believed that El Mataviahitas had followed each of these women home from the park and monitored their movements to determine if they lived alone. Based on papers found at some of the crime scenes and the use of a stethoscope as a ligature, police deduced that the killer had pretended to be a medical representative of Sivale. This ruse led to the women willingly letting him into their homes. Once inside, he would strangle his victims before rummaging through her house for any jewellery or small valuables. Despite the growing list of victims, Governor López Obrador disagreed with the police and refused to accept that there was a serial killer active in Mexico City. Instead, he claimed that the deaths were a political manoeuvre designed to derail his welfare program for senior citizens and jeopardise his upcoming presidential campaign. The governor's position was publicly supported by Mexico City's attorney and chief prosecutor, Bernardo Batiste. Despite acknowledging that some of the murders were similar, Batiste was certain that there was no little old lady killer. The government's denial couldn't be sustained indefinitely. Just 11 days into 2005, another elderly woman was strangled to death, this time with a white scarf. Between February and July, a further eight women were murdered, the majority beaten and strangled. This prompted the state prosecutor's office, via the deputy prosecutor, to finally confirm the indisputable existence of El Mataviahitas. By October 2005, seven more elderly women had lost their lives. Now accepting the danger, Chief Prosecutor Batiste was outraged that someone was targeting such vulnerable members of society, claiming that even criminals and delinquents respected their grandmothers. Despite the growing threat, investigative efforts lagged until 82-year-old Maria Gonzalez was found deceased on her living room floor, lying on her back with her legs crossed at the ankles. Maria had been beaten and strangled, becoming the 44th elderly woman killed in this manner since 1998. 
Her son was a renowned Mexican criminologist, and as she was a family member of one of their own, police were finally compelled to increase their efforts to hunt down El Mataviahitas. They launched a specialised task force named Operation Parks and Gardens to investigate the killings and distributed 70,000 flyers warning the community of the danger. Based on witness reports, El Mataviahitas was approximately 45 years old, between 170 and 175 centimetres tall, with a robust muscular physique, light brown complexion, wide oval face, and short hair. Police produced a total of 64 sketches of the possible killer. They also increased their patrols in neighbourhoods previously targeted and reportedly paid elderly women to sit in parks as bait. Investigators struggled to formulate a list of suspects as the perpetrator didn't leave behind any major clues that could lead to his identity. Chief Prosecutor Bernardo Batiste described the killer as a criminal who acts alone, takes a lot of care and has brilliant intelligence. Police weren't at a complete loss, however, as unidentified partial fingerprints had been found at 10 of the crime scenes. In an effort to better understand the person they sought, Officers for Operation Parks and Gardens participated in a week-long course on serial killers. It was taught by the French police, who had previously tracked down a serial killer named Thierry Paulin. Dubbed the Monster of Montmartre, Paulin's crimes shared notable similarities to those committed by El Mataviahitas. He had murdered up to 21 elderly women, and his slayings were characterised by beatings, robberies and strangulations. As described by author Susana Vargas Cervantes, the Paris police inspector who conducted the training told the Mexican police officers that the arrest of Paulan had not been due to, quote, chance or luck, because that does not exist. Less than three weeks later, Joel Lopez discovered the brutalised body of his landlady, Ana Maria Reyes, on her living room floor. Quickly snapping out of the shock, Joel spun around and ran back out of the house to catch up with the person who'd fled the building the moment he arrived. Looking up and down the street, he caught sight of the muscular figure in black pants and a red sweater fleeing north. By chance, two policemen were on patrol only metres away. They heard Howell shouting for their attention, ordering them to pursue the person up ahead. The officers took off and cornered the individual, who swung two bags at their heads in a failed attempt to avoid capture. A search of these bags uncovered a folder that contained the details of several women registered with the government's elderly assistance program. There was also a C. Vale identification badge and several medical instruments. The officers considered what they had before them. An elderly woman had just been murdered and the suspect in custody was tall, muscular, with short hair and was in possession of Civale paraphernalia. Realisation dawned. They had just apprehended El Mataviahitas. Within minutes, the area was swarming with additional police, as well as Chief Prosecutor Bernardo Batiste and a crowd of reporters. To their astonishment, the killer before them was a woman. The little old lady killer was 48-year-old Juana Barraza. Case File will be back shortly. Thank you for supporting us by listening to this episode's sponsors. According to Crime Data, the average home break-in lasts between 8 and 10 minutes. That's why you need a home security system that responds quickly and forcefully. For those on the case file team, that's Simply Safe Home Security. 
At Simply Safe, your safety is the only thing that matters. They protect you with cutting edge security technology powered by monitoring agents who always have your back. Here's why we love it. With Simply Safe, your home is monitored 24 7 using proprietary advanced response technology. If one of their monitoring agents detect a threat, they'll dispatch police or first responders straight away, even if you're not home or can't be reached. Simply Safe blankets your home in protection with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door. There are HD security cameras for inside and outside, as well as smarter ways to detect motion that only alert you when a threat is real. Simply Safe even has hazard sensors that instantly detect fires, floods, and other threats. You can't put a price on that peace of mind. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash casefile. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. Go to simplysafe.com slash casefile. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Wealthy businessman Casey Parker has been murdered. You and a dedicated team of private detectives have been hired to solve the case. The only problem? The suspect list is long and the list of potential evidence is even longer. Who's on your side? Who can you trust? Be the first to solve the mystery when you order Casefile Truth and Deception, the riveting, endlessly replayable strategy board game based on our podcast. Put yourself in the detective's shoes with Casefile Truth and Deception. Using 44 beautifully illustrated cards, players take turns trading evidence to get closer to the truth. But remember, this is a game of deception as well. Someone might plant false evidence to throw you and the other detectives off track. Be the first detective to solve this crime by correctly naming the suspect, weapon, motive, and location of Casey's murder and bring the killer to justice. Same victim, different crime. Will you solve it first? Casefile Truth and Deception is 100% fictional and not based on any real-life events. It is available now in the US at Walmart and in the UK at Argos and Smith's Toys. It's also available to purchase online at Amazon. To learn more, visit our website casefilepodcast.com and click on the game link at the top of the page. Thank you for listening to this episode's ads. By supporting our sponsors, you support Casefile to continue to deliver quality content. What struck most people when they first set eyes on Juana Barraza was her size. She was taller than the average Mexican man and towered over almost every woman. Juana was also broad-shouldered, robustly athletic, and wore her hair short. Consequently, she was often described as masculine in appearance. Her physicality was intentional, something she had worked to increase over the years. Since her 30s, Juana Barraza had trained at least twice a week doing sit-ups, running stairs, and lifting weights, all in support of her career as a lucha libre wrestler. Inside the ring, Juana had fashioned herself into one of the villains of wrestling, opting to embody a rule-breaking ruder instead of a straight-shooting technica. Her chosen stage name was La Dama del Silencio, the Silent Lady, which she claimed reflected her quiet nature and isolated lifestyle. As the silent lady, Juana Barraza wore a short-sleeved pink, gold and silver unitard cinched at the waist with a large silver butterfly belt buckle. She matched it with a pair of pink and gold calf-high boots and a pink and silver butterfly mask. Juana Barraza spent her wrestling career performing on weekends in the smaller regional areas across Mexico. On average, she earned the equivalent of about 25 US dollars per match, which was generally not enough to support herself and her family. 
To supplement her income, she performed domestic services such as cleaning, washing and ironing around her neighbourhood. During particularly harsh times, Juana also resorted to petty theft. She stole from shops and markets and eventually graduated to home burglaries. Juana Barraza performed as the silent lady for 10 years, until one day in 2001 when she injured her spine during a match. Doctors gave her a choice, give up wrestling or become paralysed. Juana reluctantly retired from the ring. She remained connected to the industry by becoming a Lucha Libre promoter. Only one week before her capture, Juana was interviewed live on national television by Mexican station TV Azteca. She was standing inside the Arena Coliseo wearing a red shirt and speaking about her time as a former luchadora. A smiling Juana told the interviewer that she was a ruder, both in the ring and at home. A ruder from the bottom of her heart. Two days after Juana Barraza's arrest, the president of the National Center for Criminal Investigation admitted that her capture was a result of good luck rather than good police work. The public would soon discover exactly how ineffective the authorities had been in their investigations. In the year prior to Juana Barraza's capture, Police had received numerous sightings of a tall, broad-shouldered woman near multiple crime scenes. Months earlier, in July 2005, 83-year-old Ignacia Puebla had answered her door to a tall, broad-shouldered woman with short hair who identified herself as being from the government's elderly assistance program. After she entered the home, the woman realised that Ignacia was not alone. Her son was staying there, recovering from a broken leg. The woman offered to look at an x-ray of the leg and even checked Ignacia's blood pressure. At that point, another of Ignacia's children arrived at her home and the woman hastily made her exit. Ignacia and her children didn't realise until some time later that the woman had stolen some of Ignacia's belongings. A partial fingerprint lifted from the x-ray handled by the woman was considered a very close match to Juana Barraza. Her fingerprints were also notably similar to partial prints uncovered at 10 of the murder scenes. Despite growing indications that El Mataviahitas was a woman, police had been reluctant to pursue this line of investigation. Instead, They reconciled the witness accounts by assuming the killer must have been a man dressed in women's clothing. They were convinced that a woman would not have the requisite strength to beat and strangle these elderly victims. Without any evidence pointing to such a conclusion, the police then decided that the killer must either be a gay man or a trans woman. Based on this assumption, in October 2005, about three months prior to the capture of Juana Barraza, police arrested nearly 50 trans sex workers as murder suspects, despite none matching any description of El Mataviahitas. When none of their fingerprints matched those found at any of the crime scenes, all of these trans women were released. Despite this, Chief Prosecutor Bernardo Batiste remained convinced that the killer had to be a gay man or a trans woman. Some speculated that Batiste was blindly aligning his theory to the French experience with the monster of Montmartre, Thierry Paulan. Paulan was a gay man and a drag queen who had disguised himself in women's clothes when committing his murders. In any case, Now that the authorities had Juana Barraza in custody, they were intent on proving that she was the killer of Mexico City's grandmothers. 
Back in November 2005, a three-dimensional bust was constructed out of modelling clay and plasticine in the likeness of the unidentified El Mataviahitas. This bust was wheeled out during the press conference held on the day of Juana Barraza's arrest and the similarities were clear. The media noted that the bust, like Juana, was also wearing a red sweater. This sweater shaped theories around a possible motive for the slayings, with some speculating that its colour was a testament to Juana's aggressive nature. A Department of Justice officer determined that Juana was menstruating at the time of her capture and claimed that this, combined with the full moon, had led her to kill. Another theory was put forward by consultant criminologist Martine Baron and Dr. Feggy Ostrowski, the neuropsychologist who assessed Juana Barraza post-arrest. They believed that Juana had been driven to kill after being deprived of her previous outlet for aggression. Once she could no longer perform as a luchadora due to her injury, she resorted to committing murder for emotional release. The truth behind Juana's actions came from the woman herself. Almost immediately after her arrest, she confessed to murdering Ana Maria Reyes and in doing so, revealed her true feelings towards elderly women in general. She told homicide detectives that she hated old women. Quote, I know it's not an excuse, that I do not deserve forgiveness from God or from anyone. When I saw the old ladies, I felt a lot of anger and more when they showed superiority or believed that they could humiliate me for their money. According to Juana, her hatred was fueled by her relationship with her mother. Juana Barraza was born in 1957 in a rural town north of Mexico City. Her mother, Husta, was an alcoholic teenager who worked as a domestic cleaner and occasional sex worker. Her father, Trinidad, was a truck driver and sheep farmer who abandoned his family when Juana was only a few months old. Husta relocated herself and baby Juana to Mexico City, where she eventually married a man named Gerardo Hernandez, who by all accounts was a loving parent to Juana and the two children he and Husta had together. But finances were very tight and the family could barely afford to eat. Juana and her siblings slept on the ground each night with only bags of cement to keep them warm. Huster and Gerardo were absent from the home much of the time. Consequently, Juana cooked, cleaned and raised her younger siblings. Gerardo did not think education was important for girls, whom he believed were only destined to become housewives, and so Juana never learned to read or write. She was also not permitted to attend school, play in the streets, or socialise with children her own age. Juana felt little support from her mother Husta, who constantly verbally and physically abused her, Their relationship reached its lowest point when Husta traded 13-year-old Juana to a 62-year-old man named Jose Lugo in exchange for three beers. Lugo told Juana that she would never see her family again. Unable to believe that her mother could do such a horrible thing, Juana thought it must have been a joke and that her mother would return to collect her momentarily. When that did not happen, Juana held out hope that her stepfather, Gerardo, would rescue her. Unbeknown to Juana, Husta had told her husband that Juana had run away. She insisted that he shouldn't try to find her. On the first night of her enslavement, Juana was beaten, tied to the bed by her wrists, and raped. She wasn't permitted to leave Lugo's house and was forced to do all his domestic work. Juana was repeatedly raped and beaten by Lugo and other men, 
even after she became pregnant. She miscarried her first pregnancy. Her second, at age 16, resulted in the birth of a son. It was not until Juana was 18 years old that she was rescued by her stepfather. Gerardo never believed Husta's story that Juana had run away and had looked for her. Shortly after Juana's rescue, Husta died from cirrhosis of the liver. In the years that followed her mother's death, Juana married and had a daughter with an abusive man. She escaped this relationship, entered another, and had two more children. This relationship also eventually turned abusive, so Juana left to raise her children as a single mother. When Juana was 30 years old, her stepfather Gerardo passed away from heart complications. She would later tell her court-appointed neuropsychologist, Dr. Feggy Ostrowski, that contrary to the lack of emotion she felt at her mother's passing, Gerardo's death had left her feeling helpless and abandoned. Then, in 1998, Juana's eldest child was killed at the age of 24 as a result of gang violence. Juana described her son's death to Dr. Ostrowski as the saddest moment of her life. During one of their sessions, Juana Barraza told Dr. Ostrowski that she was sorry for the murder of Ana Maria Reyes, but maintained that she did not kill anyone else. In another session the following month, she recanted her confession and denied murdering anyone. She then implicated an unknown man in Ana Maria's murder. Ultimately, Juana Barraza was charged with 16 murders, including that of Ana Maria Reyes. As no juries are used in criminal trials in Mexico, Juana Barraza's case was presented to a judge only. In March 2008, they found her guilty of all 16 murders, along with 12 robberies. She was sentenced to a total of 759 years in prison, the longest in Mexican history involving a murder conviction. However, Mexico's penal code only permits a maximum incarceration term of 50 years. If Juana Barraza is still alive in 2058, she will be released at the age of 100. Until this time, she is not eligible for any reduced sentence or probation, and so she will very likely die in prison. From 1998 until the capture of Juana Barraza in 2006, 56 elderly women were murdered in Mexico City. For as long as possible, Governor Andres Manuel López Obrador and Chief Prosecutor Bernardo Batiste tried to dismiss public fears that the grandmothers of Mexico City were being specifically targeted. After 23 women had already been killed, Batiste announced, What I want to say with all certainty is that there is no serial killer. To the surprise of the community, nine months and 13 murders later, Batiste claimed that the threat was over as the murders had been solved. Somewhat quietly during the course of 2004, police had separately arrested and charged two people for the murders of three victims. They alleged that both suspects had dressed as a nurse, complete with wig and dress, and had claimed to work for Mexico City's elderly assistance program in order to gain access to their victims' homes. First to be arrested was housewife Araceli Vasquez. Vasquez was charged for the 2003 murder of Gloria Riso. About six months later, street merchant Jorge Tablas was arrested for the murder of Maria Salcida, the very first victim strangled in May of 1998. Tablas's second victim was said to be Maria Guzman, strangled in 2003 with a pair of tights. 
Both Vasquez and Tablas denied the allegations against them. In Tablas's case, Maria's neighbour had identified him after police arranged for Tablas to be dressed in a white coat and positioned on the street outside Maria's house for an in situ one person lineup. On Friday, October 22, 2004, a few weeks after the arrest of Tablas, Chief Prosecutor Batiste stated confidently We consider that the murders have already been solved. This was despite police only implicating Vasquez and Tablas in just three of the murders out of the 30-odd that had so far taken place, and the fact that murders continued long after their arrests. In fact, on the very same day that Chief Prosecutor Batiste told the grandmothers of Mexico City that they were once again safe, 70-year-old Maria Martinez returned home around 5.30pm. Before she could change out of her crisp white shirt and pressed black trousers into something more comfortable, there was a knock at her door. In the days that followed, Maria failed to show up for a family gathering. When repeated calls to Maria went unanswered, her sister Guadalupe drove to Mexico City to check in on her. It was about four o'clock in the morning when Guadalupe arrived at Maria's apartment. She opened the door and turned on a light. The living room was a mess, as if someone had furiously rummaged through every drawer. Maria sat unmoving and silent on the sofa, her body bent forward. She had been strangled by a stethoscope so forcefully that her neck had snapped. Guadalupe sat beside her sister's hunched over frame. Next to Maria were a number of scattered photographs showing her at a ceremony a few months prior, receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award for her 50-year service as a schoolteacher. Guadalupe hugged Maria tightly and eased her body back into a more comfortable sitting position. There was nothing that she could do about the blood on her sister's white shirt, but she did wipe the blood off her sister's face. Juana Barraza would ultimately face justice for the murder of Maria Martinez and 15 other elderly women. However, There is no evidence that investigations continued once she was behind bars. The murders of more than 30 other elderly women attributed to El Mataviahitas remain unsolved. Casefile presents a new Spotify exclusive podcast, Maddie. No one is ever prepared for a loved one to suddenly disappear. That's the thing about missingness. When someone you love vanishes into thin air, every family that experiences it has to figure it out for themselves. We started ringing around Matt's friends. What the hell is he not doing at work? And why hasn't he even called them? I just sat there going, oh my God, oh my God. Something wasn't right. The Levisons grew more worried by the minute. He's walking up and down like a cage lion and he's sweating and he's clammy. The man has no emotions at all. Towards the end, he wouldn't let Matt out of his sight. Narrated by Lauren O'Keefe, the founder of the Missing Persons Advocacy Network and host of Case File Presents podcast, What's Missing? The police informed Mark and Faye Levison that they no longer considered Matt a missing person. They told Faye and I that the, the case had been transferred to homicide. And he said... I've called the police, I've found a grave, there's a mattock in the bush. The receipt showed that two items had been purchased, duct tape and a Garden Master brand mattock. I think we were in shock for ages after that. The world just seemed to stand still. Hear how a family took on the system to try and find justice for their son. For the very first time, it made us feel like the police 
and us were no longer on the same side. And then he sat there and said to me, it was Matt's lifestyle that had him murdered. No, I just said the bullshit stops now. That's, that's ridiculous. Some people in this world never take no for an answer, especially when they're fighting for someone they love. Nothing is perfect. And we thought, you know, with the chance of finding Matt, it's probably one in a million, one in ten million, but it wasn't zero. So we've got to give it a go. He was never going to win against us. Not for finding Maddie. Maddie, the latest podcast from Casefile Presents, available September 19th, only on Spotify. It's not a justice system, it's just a system.